us on a journey on this narrow road and those who've gone before us line the way cheering on the faithful encouraging the weary their lives a stirring testament of God sustaining grace surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us run the race not only for the prize but as those who've gone before us let us leave to those behind us a heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives oh may all who come behind us find us faithful may the fire of our devotion light their way may the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey oh may all who come behind us find us faithful after all our hopes and dreams have come and gone and our children sift through all we've left behind may the truths that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find oh may all who come behind us find us faithful may the fire of our devotion light their way may the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey oh may all who come behind us find us faithful may the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey oh may all who come behind us find us Find us faithful. Thank you very much. We are in the book of Proverbs again. Before we get started, I want to say a couple things. I encourage you. I would love to have a great crowd here on that first Saturday in uh, April for our Super Saturday and go out and get a lot of invitations out. It's going to be exciting. We're just going to split up, go throughout the city. And so I encourage you, if you don't typically come on that day, maybe you don't visit for Sunday school, bus route, even though you still come on Tuesdays, I encourage you. We're going to meet an auditorium, a Spanish ministry. We're just going to go for it. And so I encourage you to be here for that. Remember, you can invite anybody, any place, any time. Okay? I think we should do that. And we ought to get to where we strive to invite everybody, every place, every time. I was met a lady, and I, I, I gave her an invitation to church. She goes, oh, you're the Baptist church. She had heard of us. And she goes, you know, she goes, I was, I think she was getting her hair done, something I do quite often. She goes, uh, I, I was getting my hair done, and a Filipino lady from your church invited me to your church. I'm like, that's good. And by the way, that's how it should be in our community. We want to be, uh, we want to be the church that everybody in this community knows that's the church that tries to get you there tries to get you to church. And so, um, you know, we, we're, we have these 40,000 invitations, and let's do our part. Proverbs, we're talking about wisdom and relationships. We've been in Proverbs now. We started in January of 2015, and we, we, took, we take some time off during the summer. We have special guests and missions conference and things like that. And so every summer we do something different. We picked it up in 2016. We picked it up here. The summer we'll do something different. But uh, listen, we could we could be uh, we could have a lot of lessons in Proverbs. If there's a book you ought to know, 
Proverbs is it. Proverbs deals with wisdom and very, very practical things. And we're talking about wisdom in relationship. What are the two greatest commands in the Bible that Jesus gave us? The first one is to love. Uh, that was weak. You sound like a bunch of Presbyterians there. Let's, let's bump it up. To love. Okay. You, now, now, you're, now you're almost Baptist there. The second one is to love others. Good. And so if we're going to love others, we need to have relationships. Some of the greatest blessings are found in relationships. Some of the greatest cursings can be found in relationships. It's all about how we relate one with another. The Bible tells us that. Last time we were together, we, we, we only talked about two points. We talked about number six. We've already, the other ones, if you didn't listen, get them, they're online. You can listen to them. We said number six last time we met, which is two weeks ago, use your words as tools. And then we said number seven, it is better to enjoy peace in relationships than to have property and pres- uh, prosperity with strife. This is new, number eight. When we live a life that is pleasing to God, we will have, all the papers folder reminds me of the time I was reading the wrong verse, but I looked at Brother Pineda, he was just staring at his paper, so I thought we were good. Uh, When we live a life that is pleasing to God, we will have better relationships with man, or woman, you know, man's in a generic sense. Proverbs 16, 7, listen to this. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now these are, the Proverbs are our wisdom principles. Now, sometimes we can't control other people. There will be people that for the sake they have a problem with Christ, they're an enemy of God, and there's nothing we can do to have a good relationship with them. We can be nice, we can be kind, and um, and, 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 and they don't, they don't, I remember we were managing properties down in Broadway, and we had, there was a tenant that was there when we took over the property, managing it. And he was, a, he was a homosexual and came home from church one Sunday. And he was waiting outside my door. And um, I guess what had happened is his, he had a plumbing issue. And I'm like, sorry, I was at church. But he called the office and they sent a plumber out. And he started yelling at me. I decided for whatever reason it was, I have no idea, I decided just to let him yell. And, and I'm like, sorry about that. You know, I'm sorry you had a bad day or whatever. And then he started cussing at me, you blanking Christian. That had nothing to do with it. That had nothing to do with it. And he said that a few times. And, um, and then he turned to left. He tr- I, I didn't want to get in a fight with him, although if he would have started it, that wouldn't have bothered me a whole lot. He started walking away, and as he walked away, he goes, maybe I ought to just move out of here. And I just couldn't resist it. I said, you know, that'd probably be a good idea. He didn't appreciate that. By the way, I will say this. We called our management company and said, if I would have said, you know, you blank homosexual, you'd have fired us. How come he can get away with that? And to credit, our company called and said, if you ever say that again, we're going to kick you out to them. They wouldn't do that now. Times have changed. I'm just glad I'm not down there. But there are some people. By the way, you know why they did that? They've never had a problem with, I didn't even deal with them. Because there's a spiritual thing there. They have a problem. He had a problem with God, and for the most part, they have a problem with God. And guess what? If you represent God, that's just how it is. But this is a general principle, though. The, the better we have a relationship with God, the better our relationship will man, man will be overall. That's just how it works. We, as we seek to please the Lord our life, in our life and in our relationships with him, we can have better relationship with those, even some of those that do not like us. You can actually win them over. Now, not everybody, okay? But our, look, at our goal is not to necessarily go out and pick a fight. Now, sometimes we get because we're standing for the Lord. And if that happens, la-di-da, okay? That's good. That's because that shows we're doing something right. But, but we should do our best to have a good relationship with God and with our fellow man the best that we can. A lot of times, the problems are because of dealings we've had and how we've handled situations. 
past experiences. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 4. It says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. What happens if we do that? For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of who? God and man. I know this, wherever your level is at in relationship with people, having a right relationship with God will make it better. That's just, that's just how it is. God, look, you know, God can use your Christianity to change people's minds. God can use your Christianity if you handle things in a right way to help you out. Now, it's not all the time. I heard this story. There was a man, his name was Jim Voss. Back in the 40s and 50s, he, uh, he was an electronical whiz. And um, this is illegal. Someone should tell the Obama administration this. But he was good at wiretapping. It's amazing if you're a certain party, how you can just get away with breaking the law. Okay? But anyhow, that's a message for another day. But this guy, he could do wiretapping. Now, his wife was a Christian. And, um, and so he, he, you know, every now and then he'd go to church to appease her. Well, through his skills, he got hooked up with some shady lawyers, and he would do some things and, and do some wiretapping for them. And uh, they connected him with a famous criminal in, in, in Los Angeles, Mickey Cohen. Uh, he did some work for him. He got hooked up with a guy in St. Louis. I forget the guy's last name. It was Andy something. He figured out, and this is, by the way, for those of you that are, are older, you wouldn't understand. This is back in the days when, when, you know, technology was not very good. He figured out a way how to tap the wires, and he could slow down information. And so what this guy in St. Louis, when he found out about it, what he would do is he would tap the wires of the horse races. And he would slow down by a little over two minutes the results so that these, these gangsters could go and they could bet on these horses right before, not legally, but right at these bookie places right before uh, they would stop the betting because they already knew who the horses were that won. So he set up this scheme for them in Los Angeles, and these guys were coming out in a couple weeks to meet him. Well, he was going with his wife one day, and there was a huge revival in Los Angeles. This was in the early 50s. And to appease his wife, he went. Huge tent. He got under conviction. He got saved. He got really saved. He went home and realized, I cannot be a part of this. He was reading his Bible, and he just read the verses right here. So shall I find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. And he thought, I've got to do the right thing. He called this guy in St. Louis and said, I ain't doing it. I can't. And the guy goes, you know, mobsters, they don't really take too kindly to that. He said, oh, you will do it. He goes, I can't do it anymore. He goes, you'll do it. A few days later, these guys show up outside of his front door. It's the guy from St. Louis. So he figures, I got nothing to lose. I'm just going to. Pulled him out there and said, you're going to do this. He goes, I can't. I became a Christian. He goes, don't give me that garbage. Who are you working for? What are you doing? He goes, I became a Christian. And with the little knowledge he had, he started talking to this guy. What about you? And this gangster realized that he was sincere. And he let him go. Now, that doesn't always happen, okay? <laughs> but I'm just telling you, when you're different and you get saved and your attitude changes, that comes too close. I'm going to smash that thing. Um, it, 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 people notice that. And that could change relationships. That's the whole point. I like Acts chapter 5, verse 29. What do we do if, if it doesn't change relationships? Good question. Peter, Acts 5, 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. I mean, they were getting threatened and they're like, I, I get what you're saying. Uh, you know, I'm picking up what you're putting down, but I, I'm not doing it. Here's, the, here's how it works. We obey God first, then we obey man. Yeah. Laws. If laws violate God, God wins. Yeah. And that's how it works. Sometimes God honors our choice of obeying him over the consequences of those who oppose us. And by the way, if he doesn't, it's still the right thing to do. 
Your boss asks you to lie at work. Just say, I can't do that. Now, don't say, you flaming pagan. Do you know how hot hell is going to be for you? No. You say, you know what? I'm a Christian. We had a guy one time in our church. His boss asked him to lie. And I don't even know where he got this phrase. He just came up with that on the top of his head. His boss said, can you lie? And he said, you know what? I can't do that because if I lie for you, I'll lie to you. And the boss said, that actually makes sense. Now, he may not have been happy that he wouldn't lie for him to a customer, but I guarantee you it, he trusted him. Yep. You got to do the right thing. Right. Heard a story. In early days of our church, when we were a Cambodian church, there was a Cambodian pastor in the area, and I heard his story how he, he fled from the Khmer Rouge. And, and it was on Unshackled. How many of you ever heard that old show where they do their life stories? And I listened to the story. It was amazing. I don't know if I'd have been able to do this, but they were killing anybody that, that worked for certain organizations, particularly Christian organizations, or had any kind of schooling or intelligence. They were going to start fresh with the farm people of the land. They are going to kill all the... And so this guy, he was trying to escape, and a soldier pulled him over and said, um, who are you? He gave him his name. He goes, what do you do? He's like, well, and he named the Christian organization he worked for. And the guy looked at him and said, why are you telling me that? Don't you know that by you telling me that, I have to kill you? And the guy just looked at him and said, I'm a Christian. I cannot lie to you. And the guy goes, I don't know. Just get out of here. So I I don't know if I'd want to put that to the test. I'd like to see how that would work out for you. Those are worst case scenarios. Say, none of us are going to fall into that. Okay, what about the relationships we have with people at work? What about the relationships we have with family members? Maybe some of them unsaved. Relationships we have in our own families. I know this, if we try to seek to please the Lord, that is going to reflect in our character and who we are, and that should help us in our relationships. But what do we do without those who have something against us or who are our enemies? I knew you would ask. Look at Matthew chapter 5 there. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. <laughs> why, are we, why do we always have, there's always a catch. The, the tough stuff. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Maybe that's what I should have done to the guy in the apartment, but it felt pretty good. By the way, tragically, about a month after that, him and his boyfriend broke up and moved out. I was crushed. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren or only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans also? Listen to me. Anybody can get along with people that like you. Anybody can get along with people who are your brethren. Okay? We can get along pretty good with each other in church if we're on the same Wayne leak, but what about people that come into our church that we don't know? Are we going to love them the same way? Unsafe people will treat people that treat them right, right. Now it's for self-gain. Jesus said, how are you treating them? You don't treat them the way they treat you. And that doesn't mean you let people take advantage of you. I don't know if I think it was John F. Kennedy that said, forgive your enemies, but know where they're at. Okay, in other words, don't let them keep using you. Not here, Romans chapter 12. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. We, like, we would like to do the opposite, right? Curse them and bless not. It's the Bible. Proverbs, uh, Romans chapter 12, there. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, let him starve to dead. Rejoice. Oh, wait a minute. That's the new Myers version. Emma, yeah. Feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, now this, this I can buy into. The other verses I'm struggling. Pray for me. For in doing so, thou shalt re- heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome evil, 
but overcome evil with good. Did you get that? Say, well, I'm going to, I do good to someone that, that was mean to me. Best case, worst case scenario is you're, you're going to plague their mind. I remember years ago, pastor, at, we, were, we were playing basketball at the old, old basketball, at our old, um, over on Anaheim. We played all the time back then. Uh, we'd play with all the kids that would come in the neighborhood. A bunch of teenagers, young adults would come. We're always out there playing with them. And this one kid, I don't know why, I wasn't there, but I heard it. And he was a kid that played quite often there. He got upset with Pastor and was saying things to him, mean things. Personally, I think someone should have cleaned his clock. Don't let him talk to the pastor like that. But, you know, Pastor's not like, Pastor Esposito wasn't like that. So later on, Pastor found out that um, he needed, a, uh, he, he, his shoes were looked a little bit worn. So what Pastor did, he had one of the guys found out his si- find out his size, and he bought the guy a new pair of shoes. And the next time the guy was over on our, all the neighborhood kids, whether they went to our church or not, would come over. And he was over there playing basketball, and Pastor put a note and put the shoes in his car for him. That kind of shut the kid up. Kind of changed his perspective. I still think someone should have cleaned his clock, but changed his perspective. I guess the difference is Pastor Esposito is a Christian. I'm not there yet. Um, you know what he was doing? He was doing what the Bible said. The Bible always, it like, throws a wrench in our wheel, doesn't it? And he did the right thing. That's what we should do. So what do we do? We seek to please the Lord. And when we seek to please the Lord, we learn things about treating people and how we ought to act that help our relationships to be much, much better. And as we seek to obey God... Those principles kick in, and God blesses our relationships because we're his child and we're living right. Number nine, a true friend will always be one. Their relationship stands the test of time. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Most friendships in this world are often shallow and fleeting, aren't they? Well, we, you know, we used to get along. We used to be friends and blah, 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 blah. What is it? Something happened. Oh, you know, it's no longer working for me. I'm moving on. Okay. Most friendships are based on what can I gain from this relationship rather than what can I give to this relationship. It's the mindset. If as a friendship, the friendship to you is it what can I bring to the table It's just, what can I take off the table? That's not really being a friend. And he says, a friend loveth at all times. Look, there's two examples for both sides of this verse. Friend loveth at all times. Remember the prodigal son? He didn't have the right friends. I mean, as long as he had money, he had friends. As long as there was a party, he had some people. But what happened? He ran out. He began to be in want Lack. What happened? Where were all of his friends when he had the money? They had moved on because he no longer was supplying for them. And when he is in need, they had nothing to do with him. Nothing. Fairweather friends. Back in the day, we used to have more gangbangers, and we were kind of reaching those kind of teenagers. I don't know how many times we'd go out. I remember one time we were over on one of the streets down here off of 10th Street, and we're talking to this guy, and he had just... Freshly got out of jail, and we were talking to him. He goes, he goes, you know what? I had all my homies, and they they do anything for me, but as soon as I got to jail, it was ghost town. Not one of them talked to me. Not one. They all ditched him. I remember hearing about um, uh, one of the football players, the old Dallas Cowboy players. Who was, uh, uh, when Troy Hickman was on there, who was their best wide receiver, Tony? Um, Irvin. Irvin. I heard Irvin say one. I don't even know why I heard him say it. He had some legal troubles. And he said, I was in court. I had all my teammates. I had all my friends. One person showed up in court to support me. It was Troy Aikman. He goes, where was everyone else? A true friend is there for you when you need a friend. They don't give up on it. It's like, oh, you know what? It's too much hassle for me. It's costing me time. It's costing me energy. If you're a true friend. The prodigal found out, you know what? That friendship wasn't real good. Friendship starts when problems arise. 
and not problems between the friendships. I mean, when the, one of your friends has a problem, that's when a real friend shows, on, shows up on the front door. Amen. What can I do for you? What do you need? I'm here for you. Let me help. On the other side, you have Joseph. All that his brothers did for him, did not for him, did to him. He had the power of the ultimate payback. Now, he did kind of mess their minds a little bit. You know, I, I think he deserved that, to, to be able to do that. But what did he do? He took care of them, their families, and even after dad died, he goes, don't worry. I know you guys meant it for evil, but you know what? I'm taking care of you guys. You're my brothers. He didn't have to do that, but he did. A true friend is always there. Choose your friends wisely. By the way, you ought to be a friend that others would want to have. Proverbs 19, 7. All the brethren of the poor do hate him. It doesn't mean poor people aren't good friends. How much more do his friends go far from him? He pursueth them with words, yet they are wanting to him. You know why? Because they can't get anything from him. That's the point. And he's trying to, they just didn't want to have anything to do with it. One of the greatest examples of selfless friendship in the Bible is Jonathan and David. You just, there's so many verses. 1 Samuel 18, 3, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. By the way, I think the greater friend of these two is Jonathan. Jonathan's friendship cost him. When a king died, who took over? Son. Who was in line for the throne? Saul said it. Jonathan. Jonathan loved David and knew that God had already anointed David as the next king, and he was in on it. Typically, you would have expected to have some type of civil war, you know, and my family's going to fight. Hey, he was right there. Jonathan's like, you're my friend. I know what God is doing. You're first. I'm here for you. That's real friendship. Let's hope we have a friend like that. The fact of the matter is we, we do. Look at John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I have command you. Jesus laid down his life. Let's finish this one up. Number 10. If we wound somebody's spirit, we can cause them to give up. If we wound somebody's spirit, we can cause them to literally give up. Proverbs 18, 14. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit... Who can bear? Our spirit, our attitude is important in us making it and going forward. Uh, there was a man, his name was Viktor Frankl. He was a Jewish psychologist. He was rounded up by the Nazis and all of his family, and they were sent to a concentration camp. By the time the, uh, the, 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 the Nazi uh, concentration camps were, were um, liberated, only he and one sister had survived. All the rest of his family was dead. All, many of the people, he, he was able to make it through. After the war, he wrote a book. Um, it was titled Man's Search for Significance. And one of, the, one of the things he brought forth in this book is that he noticed as a psychologist is that those that were able to endure and make it through were those that had a good spirit or a good outlook. They were able to get through all of the troubles. All the nonsense they went through. An individual spirit plays a major role in the success or failure in any aspect of his life, anything that he does. Think of Daniel, all that Daniel went through. All the different kingdoms he served in. Being and you know what happened? No matter who was in charge, no matter what was going on, Daniel always ended up on top. The Bible says he had a good spirit. He had that spirit. What's our spirit like? You have a negative spirit, you're just going to have a hard time in life. If you allow people to take your spirit down, now, on the flip side, what we're talking about is those of us that wound someone's spirit. Let's not do that. I would hate to think that we do something to wound and hurt somebody so that they give up, particularly not maybe necessarily on life, they give up on the Lord. Look at the words he says. The spirit of a man will sustain. That means to nourish, support, or help endure. 
The spirit of man helps him nourish and get through his infirmity, some ickness, illness, sickness, illness, whatever's going on in his life. But a wounded spirit, literally wounded, is broken. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? Bear means support, to sustain. It says, listen, when someone's food is spirit, when someone has a good spirit, they can get through tough times. But when someone's spirit has been wounded, the, the things that they would have got through before, they can't make it now. How often do people go around wounding other spirits? We think we're this spiritual police in every single thing that's going on. That's not our job sometimes. Now, our job is to preach the truth, but our job is not to get in someone's face unless they're doing something that, that's causing harm to somebody else. We mentioned that very early on in the book of Proverbs. We just say things hurtfully, and we judge people sometimes, and we say things, and that's not true about them at all, and we hurt their spirit. Have you ever wounded someone's spirit? Maybe a person, maybe a friend, maybe a spouse. I've never done that. My toes are crossed. Who, we just, you could see it. The Bible tells us that we're supposed to be a spirit builder. You ever, the, the New Testament word is edifying. Edify, build up. We're supposed to build someone's spirit up, not tear it down. Now, if we're preaching and teaching and someone doesn't like what the Bible says and that bothers them, that's between them and God. If they want to use that to go sideways, that's on them. But I'm saying, sometimes we do things and we hurt people's spirit. People usually act the way we see or think, the way we think they are, the way we see them. Sometimes we treat someone a certain way because that's how we think they are. And that's how usually people come down to. I heard a story, a guy was teaching in a Bible college and it was his first year teaching. It was a big college and they had, they'd have the same class but they would have several of them, you know, like whatever it was, Bible, Old Testament survey and they'd have two or three different classes. There was so many students. And the new teacher was in the lounge talking to one of the older teachers. He goes, what are you teaching? And he said, one of the classes I'm teaching, Old Testament, and it's, it's the number three track. And the guy goes, wow, you're fortunate. He goes, what are you talking about? He goes, what they do is track three is they take all of the best, the brightest students, and they put them together in that class, and they gave that one to you. These, these kids are going to really get it. And he thought, Wow. So what he did is, in that one class, he challenged that class to do more. He taught them more, gave them more assignments, did things, challenged them. And he told the other teachers what's going on. He goes, you're right. These kids are just, these kids are taking it in. These kids are doing it. When he got to the, towards the end of the semester, he was talking to a different teacher and said, man, I, I was fortunate enough this year to get that track three, and these kids, they're the best of the best. And, and she goes, what are you talking about? And he goes, you know, the, she goes, they stopped that. They just took all that. They felt that wasn't fair, so they just dispersed the kids all amongst the class. They didn't put the best kids in that class. But that ha teacher had an attitude that these kids can get it, and he encouraged them and challenged them. And you know what? They went for it. Where you go to another, oh, these kids, they just, you know, oh, they can't get it. Well, they won't. It's our attitude. We tear, we tear people down instead of lifting them up. And that's very, very, very important. Spirit and attitude are important, so let's make sure in our relationships that we're not wounding people. Look at this verse here, and we'll, we'll be done. A merry heart doeth good like a, what? A medicine. But a broken spirit drieth the bones. I've, I've talked to people that have had illnesses and have went through cancer and stuff, and I've heard it on several occasions, you know they got to have the, if they're going to make it, one of the things that's going to help determine it is how's their spirit. I've known people, I can think of a couple where they got a bad diagnosis and they just kind of gave up. I really just don't want to fight it. I just want to, I'll just let it go. Okay? But that's how spirit is. But if we have a spirit, we can fight. So let's make sure that we're not the ones that are tearing people down, that we are building them up. It's okay to be an encourager, right? Do you know people need encouragement sometimes? Man, I'm going through a tough time. You know what? What, what? what can we do? We'll pray for you. You can get through this. God will see you through this. Sometimes we think, oh, maybe you're just sinning and God's getting after you. Okay, that doesn't help. All right, let's pray.